Let's pray together. Lord, we are indebted to your mercy. We praise you. And we sing because you have made us able to sing, to lift our faces to you in praise and in worship. We could not by our own nature. We dared not because of our own sins. And yet you have made us, you have sought and created worshipers where there were none amongst us. Lord, we thank you for truth and for mercy so beautifully wedded together in the gospel. And because you are true and committed to your truth, you are reliable. You will not go back on your word. And because you are merciful, you show pity to those who could not help themselves out of the mess. You didn't give us what we deserved. You poured out your wrath on Christ. And now we can hear your voice. We thank you for your word, O oh God, for the privilege of having it in our own language. It is perfect, restores the soul. It is sure and makes wise the simple. It is right and rejoices our hearts. It is pure and enlightens our eyes. It is clean and endures forever. And it is true, righteous altogether, more desirable than anything sweeter than anything, is your word. We pray by your Holy Spirit this morning that we would hear your voice in it, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 15, and we are bringing to a close this morning this extended section on preferential matters, those things which are not expressly commanded of Christians and not expressly prohibited of Christians, these preferential areas. And the pages of the New Testament is a shadow of controversy and a fertile soil for bitterness and contention, and that is the relationships between Jews and Gentiles in the first century. There was ethnic strife and cultural diversity that brought about a real problem for the New Testament church in its first iterations. Jew-Gentile relationships were problematic. There was xenophobia, fear, racism, both directions, and the cultural differences were stark. The practices and habits were different. There had been centuries of hostility. In fact, the Jews resented the fact that Gentiles were in power over their nation, had ultimate authority over even their religious practices. This all was fertile ground for misunderstanding, for division, for disunity, for bitterness and judgmentalism when Jew and Gentile were brought together into one new man, the body of Christ, in the local assembly. Now, we've been looking at 36 verses devoted to preferential issues, differences between the weak and the strong, those who feel a confidence before God that they can practice some Christian liberty, and those who do not feel in faith, they can have that same confidence. It is quite possible that these differences in preferences often fell along ethnic divisions and cultural boundaries. It's almost as if God knew we might deal with similar things in our own day that he devoted 36 verses in the book of Romans to these issues. As we come to the conclusion of this section, we're looking this morning at verses 7 to 13 of Romans 15. And let's begin this morning by reading this text. God speaks to us this morning by the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul. Therefore, accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. For I say that Christ has become a servant to the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers and for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will give praise to you among the Gentiles and I will sing to your name. 
Again, he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. Again, Isaiah says, there shall come the root of Jesse, and he who arises to rule over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles hope. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Spirit. And what we find this morning in this section are four final elements of Paul's instructions to us on preferential issues. Four final elements of Paul's instructions. And it begins with a humbling motivation in verse 7. A humbling motivation. Notice the therefore in verse 7. Paul here is giving a summary command that wraps up everything he began in chapter 14, verse 1, down to this point. He sums it all up and says, therefore, accept one another. There's the command, accept one another. And the motivation which follows right behind it, just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. Accept one another because Christ accepted you. That is Paul's argument. It could be read, accept one another in the same way as Christ accepted us. Either this is causal, Jesus accepted us, therefore accept one another. Or manner, that is accept one another in the same way Jesus accepted us. Implied in this is a difference amongst us. We are not clones That we wouldn't have to be commanded to accept one another if everybody was exactly the same as me. But because we are different, because we have come from different backgrounds, because we have different levels of growth in the Christian life, different progress in doctrine, different convictions forged over time and through trials, we are different. And notice what God says, accept one another. As Christ has accepted us. Christ has accepted us. There is a collective in this. Back in chapter 14, verse 3, remember it was said that God has accepted your brother. And here in chapter 15, it is Christ who is said to accept us. Again and again in Romans, Paul feels very free to associate Christ with God. In fact, in this section, every member of the Trinity is at work for Christian unity in this passage. I want you to think for a moment what it meant for Christ to accept you. Just think for a moment, Christian. What did it mean for Christ, the Holy One, who never knew sin? who was sinlessly perfect, who could not sin, what did it mean for him to accept you in your sin? When you were disinterested, when you neglected God, when you were thankless and thoughtless and indifferent. Maybe you were even in open rebellion against him, railing against him, blaspheming and teaching others to blaspheme. What would it mean for Christ to accept you? It really is a staggering thought. One we can't take lightly nor take for granted. Oh, of course God would accept me because I'm me. I'm so likable. Far from it. When we understand God's true and right assessment of the human condition, We ought to be absolutely surprised that God would ever set his attention and affections on any sinner. And we ought to think like the Apostle Paul did in 1 Timothy 1. He saw himself as the chief of sinners at the head of the line. When you get a real grasp of your own sin before a holy God, this bare fact ought to floor us. Christ has accepted me. Think think about what it meant for the Christ, the Messiah, to have accepted a Jew. The Jews were entrusted with the very words of God, the promises to the patriarchs and proximity to the temple, access to the sacrifices. They were witnesses of glory and power and rescue and provision. And yet they pulled a national collective Judas 
and sold out their own Messiah, crying out en masse, crucify, crucify. Isaiah 53 and Zechariah 12 are Israel's hymn book. They are Israel's songs. Ignored by apostate Israel now, one day they will be sung by Israel. Listen to the lyrics. He was despised and we did not esteem him. We esteemed him cursed, stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He could be no Messiah if he's cursed of God. Anyone hanging on a tree is cursed. No cursed one is Messiah. He was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. They will sing the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem pierced him. What would it mean for Christ to accept such a one? Any individual Jew who came to Messiah in faith, over and against the testimony of their own nation and their own people that Jesus was a fraud. What would it mean for Christ to accept such a one as Paul? A blasphemer and a persecutor of Christ's people. The only hope for a man like Paul, the only hope for any Jew in the first century was infinitely costly grace in spite of what was deserved. No Jew got in on the coattails of Abraham. Nobody got in on mere heredity. Nobody got in on a promise to a nation as an individual before a holy God carrying his sin. What would it mean for a Gentile to be accepted by Christ? Romans 1.18 says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And Paul they had knowledge of God intrinsically, inherently in the human heart, and yet they suppressed what they saw outside in creation and inside, inward testimony of God in the human heart. They suppressed that truth in unrighteousness and went after every sort of evil, and God gave them over to further evil, and they pursued that with relish, and God gave them over and gave them over. What would it mean for the enemies of God, the worshipers of false gods, the slaves of sin, separated from Israel and the word of God and the sacrifices and the temple? What would it mean for any Gentile to be accepted by Israel's Messiah? Only mercy, only infinitely costly grace in spite of what was deserved. This is exactly where Paul led us in Romans chapter 11. After describing the Gentile plight and the Jewish plight, the irreligious and the religious, and the plight of every human being who has ever lived, save the Lord Jesus Christ. The only reason anyone enters into a right relationship with God is by the justifying blood of Jesus Christ who was offered as a propitiation through faith in that blood and it is all of mercy so that no man may boast and every mouth give praise to God. Every Jew who might have thought he was in riding Abraham's coattail says, I do not deserve to be a part of Messiah. And every Gentile who was an outsider brought in, engrafted into the rich root of the olive tree which was Israel must say, I don't belong here. Only by mercy. Only by grace. And any of you who are here this morning as believers in Jesus Christ, you know what separates you from the rest of the world who is not in God's grace yet. Mercy. Sheer mercy. Undeserved favor and kindness of God. Christ has accepted you. Christian, accept one another. Every blood-bought believer, accept one another. Listen, this is a humbling motivation because it brings us to the ends of ourselves. You can't hold something over another believer in the church and say, I'm better than you, I've arrived more than you, my preferences are better than yours. 
We have all been leveled by the cross. We have all been accepted contrary to what was deserved. And so accept one another. In verses 7 and 9, Paul will explain our acceptance with Christ. Why and how? Why did God accept us? For the glory of God. How did God accept us? By making Jesus Christ a servant. Look with me at this clarifying explanation. Point two in your outline. Verses 7 and 9 is a clarifying explanation. Paul says, accept one another as Christ accepted us to the glory of God. For I say that Christ has become a servant to the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers and for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy. Notice the end of verse 7, to the glory of God. Why did Jesus Christ accept Jews and Gentiles? For God's glory. He emptied himself and became a servant for the glory of God. That was the ultimate purpose. Notice verse 8. On behalf of the truth of God, Messiah has made a servant of the Jews. In other words, the highest priority here is the vindication of God's name. That is the glory of God and a specific attribute of God on display here. His truth, his verity, his integrity. Jesus Christ is a servant to the Jews for the glory of God, the manifestation of his truth. And notice verse 9, for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy. God is merciful to Gentiles. To what ultimate end? The doxological end, the glory of God. This harkens back to Romans 11, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. The ultimate purpose of our being accepted in Christ is the glory of God, to bring him recognition for his his intrinsic worth. The truth of his word is to be vindicated. His name is to be exalted. We are reconciled to God and to each other, ultimately for God's honor. That is the why of our acceptance with Christ. And now let's look in these verses for the how. How are we accepted with Christ? First, by Jesus becoming a servant to the circumcision, verse 8. This, of course, is a reference to the Jews. Circumcision is shorthand for the Jewish nation. Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. In fact, in Matthew 15, he said, I have come to seek the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The Jewish people were his priority in his earthly ministry. Even the gospel to the Romans written is to the Jew first and to the Greek. That was Paul's priority. And he says, he became a servant of the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God. What does that mean? That means, for the sake of the keeping up of God's promises. That not one promise of God's would fall. Jesus would be a servant to the circumcision because God said he would. Messiah would come from Israel and for Israel. But doesn't rampant Jewish unbelief nullify the promises of God? Paul asked and answered that question in Romans 3. He says, no, may it never be. Let God be found true and every man a liar. And he goes on to explain how God's word doesn't fail even when individual Jews or entire generations of Jews reject him. That, of course, has culminated in Romans 9 to 11 with God's ultimate plan for Israel. We looked at that a couple months back. Notice also, he says, to confirm the promises given to the fathers. To confirm the promises given to the fathers. I want you to notice the details here. The word to confirm here is to put something beyond doubt or to prove that the promises are reliable. It does not mean to give the fulfillment of the promises right here and now, but it means to establish them as true, as reliable, as bankable. One dictionary defines the word this way, to cause something to be known as certain, to confirm, to verify, to prove to be true and certain. It's a confirmation or a verification. The process of making known something in such a way as to confirm its truth. The process of causing people to think about something and to accept it as trustworthy. 
Messiah's coming as a servant to the Jews is an installment of Messiah's work that proves that Messiah will do everything God promised Messiah would do. What is to be thought of as trustworthy since Messiah came as a servant to the Jews? Here in this text, God's words, specifically the promises given to the fathers. Notice the plural promises and the plural fathers. Do you see that in your text? Notice Paul does not refer simply to a promise about a sin bearer. What promises did God make to the fathers? A people, a land, a blessing, a good shepherd king, new circumcised hearts, and blessings to the nations? All of these things were promised by God to the fathers. And notice that the truth of these promises was confirmed by Jesus' first coming. Not necessarily fulfilled. Not yet. But the promises to the fathers were unequivocally demonstrated to be reliable. Why? Because Messiah came as promised. Jesus' coming... And the literal fulfillment of his promises in doing so demonstrate the reliability of God's words. If Jesus fulfilled literal promises in his coming, you can bank on all the other promises God made as awaiting literal fulfillment. His service to his people as suffering Messiah put beyond doubt God's promise that he would also reign as king, the Melchizedek priest king of Psalm 110 that will rule the earth. And Paul will refer to these promises in the next four verses. Jesus accepted us, first by becoming a servant to the Jews, but second by becoming a servant to the Gentiles. This would be surprising in the first century. This would be surprising especially to the Jews in the first century. And notice what Paul says about this. He's a servant to the Gentiles on behalf of mercy. And I put that first before the, the modifier to the glory of God because in the original, it comes first. And it makes a really beautiful parallel to what Paul said earlier. Of the Jews, Jesus is a servant on behalf of the truth of God. And to the Gentiles, he is a servant on behalf of the glory of God. And the grammar is identical between the two and the parallel is striking. When the word order is reversed in the New American Standard, it, it loses sight of this a little bit. On behalf of truth and on behalf of mercy, God is doing something really remarkable here. And these two words paired together, truth and mercy, will show up again later. Mercy is having pity on someone in a miserable state. It is withholding deserved punishment. And that is what God has done with Gentiles who believe in Messiah. They don't get what they deserve. They get manifold grace by being graciously grafted into the rich root of the olive tree and the promises of Israel. Gentiles in the church era participate in spiritual blessings that were promised to Israel in the new covenant. The new covenant has not yet been fulfilled. The new covenant has heart promises for national Israel and land promises for national Israel. It hasn't been fulfilled yet. But Gentiles get to participate in it as Jesus inaugurated it on the last night he was with his disciples. And you and I get to experience things like our promise to Israel in Jeremiah 31, a new heart. Or Ezekiel, a circumcised heart, a heart of flesh instead of a heart of stone. Or Deuteronomy 30, a circumcised heart. These are things that you and I get to surprisingly, mercifully benefit from. And they were promises to Israel. We are ingrafted branches. We are outsiders made insiders. We are made to be nourished on the rich root of the olive tree. And to what end? Paul says, to glorify God. Verse 8, again, God gets the glory for himself in the rescuing of undeserving sinners. Notice the second half of verse 9, as it is written. This as it is written introduces the next portion of this text. This is a sweeping demonstration. A sweeping demonstration of Christ's service both to Jews and to Gentiles. Gentiles. 
And I say a sweeping demonstration because Paul, for the next four verses, will take us on a grand tour of redemptive history, pulling proofs from the law, the prophets, and the writings. In other words, summarizing all of the Old Testament. In doing so, he demonstrates that the entirety of Scripture presents a unified, verified, redemptive plan of God that focuses on Israel and encompasses the whole world. Notice what he says. And these four quotes are from the Old Testament. Therefore, I will give praise to you among the Gentiles, verse 9, and I will sing to your name. Verse 10, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. Verse 11, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. And verse 12, there shall come the root of Jesse, and he who arises to rule over the Gentiles. In him shall the Gentiles hope. At first glance, these texts seem to demonstrate one thing, that there will be Gentile inclusion in God's salvific program. And these texts indicate that, no doubt. But I want us to pay attention to the context of each of these quotations. There is more going on here, and if we are familiar with these Old Testament contexts, this will help us greatly. These passages are not primarily about Gentiles. Every one of these passages is about Israel with some level of Gentile participation. Each context that Paul alludes to here indicates that God has been orchestrating a plan not just for Gentiles to get saved, but for Jew and Gentile together with all of their distinctions and all of their differences to worship God. So these are proofs of acceptance or maybe demonstrations of Jesus' service to Jew and Gentile. This is truth and mercy on display for the glory of God. Truth in that God keeps his promises and mercy in that sinners get forgiven. The first one's in verse 9, and I want you to turn to 2 Samuel 22. You can keep one finger in Romans and we will make our way through these four significant texts. You could either turn to 2 Samuel 22 or to Psalm 18. Uh, they are nearly identical songs recorded in both places. 2 Samuel 22 gives us the historical context. Psalm 18 is the recording of this song in the Psalter. And they're nearly identical in their wording. 2 Samuel 22 is remarkable. Notice verse 1. David spoke the words of this song to Yahweh in the day that Yahweh delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And if we understand the context of 2 Samuel 22, it follows right after, believe it or not, 2 Samuel 21. And in 2 Samuel 21, David is delivered once again from the Philistines, from an array and an army of peoples marshaled against God's purposes, his plan, and his people. And David was delivered from them by God's hand. But notice the last little phrase of verse 1 of 2 Samuel 22, and also from the hand of Saul. Saul was the king, David's predecessor, and Saul made himself an enemy of God and made himself an enemy of David, tried to kill David multiple times, and as such became an enemy of the messianic line we talked about last week. That Saul set himself up as an antagonist to God's promises of Messiah through a Davidic dynasty. And so for David... Again, as the placeholder of Messiah, to be delivered from pagan nations and their antichrist animosity against God's line, and to be delivered from his own countrymen, literally under Saul's care, the armies of Israel going after the messianic line. It's a really remarkable foreshadowing of Christ's own experience with the Gentile nations and his own people. Rejection. Crucifixion. And so David sings this song of praise to God 
Again, the messianic line is in distress. Uh, Look down at verse 32. Notice one of the things David sings here is, Who is God besides Yahweh? And who is a rock besides our God? God is my strong fortress. David personally experiences the rescuing work of God on his behalf, and he affirms there is no God but Yahweh. Yahweh is not a regional deity for Israel alone over and against the Baals and the Ashtoreths and all the other regional deities, all the other people that get to have their gods. No, the God of Israel is the one true God. And David gives testimony to that in this song. Look down at verse 44. You have delivered me from the contentions of my people. You have kept me as head of the nations. A people whom I have not known serve me. Foreigners pretend obedience to me. These are remarkable words that actually pre-reflect the messianic rule of Messiah on the earth when it is said in Psalm 2 that even his enemies will feign obedience. They will pretend obedience to him. Why? Because he's in charge and they have to. The Messiah will reign in this way. He will rule over the nations. And David's saying, people I never even knew are bringing tribute. They are submitted to me. Look down at verse 50, therefore I will give thanks to you, O Yahweh, among the nations, and I will sing praises to your name. That's what's quoted in Romans 15. Did you notice the word nations there? I will give thanks to you, O Yahweh, among the nations. Again, what was the context for this? The pagan nations were a threat to the messianic line, and God crushed them. God took vengeance on his enemies. And David, the king to which the nations were now subject, he ruled over them. And David says, I will give thanks to you, O Yahweh, the one true God, in their presence. What is the Gentile participation with God's promises in this text? Gentiles are witnesses. There is one God, he is the God of Israel, and God establishes his king on the earth. It's a really remarkable quote that Paul picks up here. It affirms the Davidic dynasty in verse 1. It affirms there is only one God in verse 32. It affirms Davidic rule in verse 44. All of the nations subject to Davidic rule in verses 44 and 45. Praise of Yahweh among the nations. And then look at verse 51. God is a tower of deliverance to his king and shows loving kindness, grace, or mercy to his anointed to David and his, literally, his seed forever. What's on display here? The seed line through David, the anointed one who would come, that God has made promises about that Davidic dynasty that would rule the nations on the earth, even in the presence of his enemies, and God would be praised in their midst. There's a second demonstration of Christ's service to Jews and to the nations. Christ's service to Jews to uphold the truth of God's word and to Gentiles to bestow mercy. It's in verse 10. Romans 15, 10 says, again, he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. This comes out of Deuteronomy 32, and I would invite you to turn there as well. It's another song. Deuteronomy 32 is the song of Moses. The song of Moses. And we might call this Moses' swan song. It is his last song. And to lead up to the song that's recorded in chapter 32 of Deuteronomy, I want to take us back a little bit and just think about the context here. Moses is, in effect, preaching a sermon as he's about to die and the people are about to enter the land that God promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And in chapter 28, the first 14 verses, God promises blessings for obedience. If you obey, you'll be blessed. And he gives great detail to the prosperity and the blessings that will ensue if they obey. And then in verses 15 and following of Deuteronomy Deuteronomy 28, God turns and says, but if you do not obey, 
Here's the curses that will happen. This is the Mosaic Covenant. This is the agreement God made with the people of Israel at Mount Sinai through Moses, and it is a bilateral covenant. That is, it is a conditional covenant. And just as a little side note, you can footnote this, all of the unconditional covenants in the Bible have conditional elements, and this conditional covenant has unconditional elements. Just footnote that in case you wanted to know. Okay, but this is overwhelmingly a conditional covenant. If you obey, you're blessed. If you disobey, you're cursed. Look down at verse 53. This is under the cursings. This is what's going to happen to you if you disobey, and really when you disobey. Verse 53, you shall eat the offspring of your own body, the flesh of your sons and your daughters whom Yahweh your God has given you during the siege and the distress by which your enemy will oppress you. This was literally fulfilled in Lamentations 2.20, the siege of Jerusalem and people cannibalizing. God kept his word. Look down at verse 63. It shall come about that as Yahweh delighted over you to prosper you and multiply you, so Yahweh will delight over you to make you perish and destroy you, and you will be torn from the land where you are entering to possess it. What's on display there? God's glory in judgment and salvation. This is why you can't boil your Bible down to one theme, sinners getting saved, right? God is glorified by sinners getting saved in the Bible, but the Bible's about more than that. God is also glorified in judgment where he keeps his word. And if you're toying with the idea that somehow it'll all work out in the end while you reject Christ and stiff arm God and ignore his word and neglect your own soul, listen, friend, it will not go well for you because God will get his glory from you one way or the other. Look at 29, chapter 29, verse 4. Yet to this day, Moses still preaching here, Yahweh has not given you a heart to know, nor eyes to see, nor ears to hear. Why would Israel disobey and then experience the cursings? It's a heart problem. What's the solution to the heart problem? Fix it yourself, human. Uh, Human inability and sinfulness (laughs) is the problem. God's got to do a supernatural work in the heart. And that's coming. Look at verses 24 and 25. All the nations will say, why has Yahweh done this to the land? Why this great outburst of anger? Then men will say, because they forsook the covenant of Yahweh. Which covenant? The God of their uh, Yahweh, the God of their fathers. Which covenant? The one he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. Right? Which covenant did Israel break in this? The Mosaic covenant, that bilateral covenant of blessings for obedience and cursings for disobedience. And so the Lord uprooted them. Look at chapter 30, verse 1. So it shall be when all these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I've set before you, and you call them to mind in all the nations where Yahweh God has banished you, and you return to Yahweh your God and obey him with all your heart and soul according to all that I command you today, you and your sons, then Yahweh will restore you from captivity. Moses says before he dies and before the people even get into the land, that they will disobey and be removed from the land. And he says, when you turn with all your heart, God will bring you back to the land. Friends, when did they get removed from the land? Has that happened already? Yes. When did they turn to Yahweh with all their heart and be restored to the land and its blessings? Has that happened yet? You just got to write in the margin of your Bible, when, Lord? Look at verse 6. You need to read 
all of Deuteronomy 30, but especially focus here on, on verses 1 through 6. I'll just summarize it with this promise. Yahweh your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed to love Yahweh with your God with all your heart and with all your soul so that you may live. That is a promise of God. And friends, that is the new covenant embedded in the Mosaic covenant. Listen, some theological systems have said Israel has their chance and the, and the church replaces Israel. And, and they, they disobeyed God and therefore they're getting what they deserved and, and now we're the people of God. My friends, do not despise the natural branches. Israel's rebellion was no surprise to God. God foretold it before they entered the land. And he foretold their repentance and their return to the land in blessing to get the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 28, 1 to 14. And how would that come about? Well, there's a command in Deuteronomy 10, Israel, circumcise your hearts and stiffen your neck no longer. And then there's the promise in Deuteronomy 30, I will circumcise your hearts. It's Jeremiah 31. It's Ezekiel 36 and 37. It is the new covenant on display. All of that leads us up to Deuteronomy 31, and look at verse 16. Yahweh said to Moses, Behold, you're about to lie down with your fathers. This people will arise. They will play the harlot with strange gods of the land into the midst of which they are going. They will forsake me and break my covenant. No surprise. Verse 19, Therefore, write this song for yourselves. Teach it to the sons of Israel. Put it on their lips. <laughs> Put this in the hymn book. Sing it generation after generation after generation. Why? So that this song may be a witness for me against Israel. Truth. God's truth as a testimony against a rebellious nation. Verse 21. This song will testify before them as a witness. It shall not be forgotten from the lips of their descendants. For I know their, their intent they are developing today before I have brought them into the land to which I swore. So then Moses sings the song. Look down at verse 43. Rejoice, O nations, with his people. That's what Paul quotes in Romans 15. Gentile participation, right here promised in the Old Testament. Let's read the immediate context. Verse 42. God says, I will make my arrows drunk with blood. My sword will devour flesh with the blood of the slain and the captives from the long-haired leaders of the enemy. Rejoice, O nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants. He will render vengeance on his adversaries, and he will atone for his land and his people. What is the promise of God to the fathers, and what is the mercy to the Gentiles? God will do everything he said he would do, down to the letter. And the Gentiles that attach themselves to the promises of God made to Israel, but benefiting Gentiles like us, the ones who say, I want to be grafted into the rich root of the olive tree, God says, join with me, rejoice with my people while I take vengeance on my enemies. That day's coming. It hasn't yet happened. That day is coming. Verse 11 of Romans 15. Turn back there again. This, this one will be a little bit quicker. This is a quote of Psalm 117, and, and Paul quotes one verse. We're going to read the entire psalm of 119. No, not Psalm 119. Psalm 117. It is the shortest psalm, two verses. Praise Yahweh, all nations, laud him, all peoples. That's what Paul quotes. Pretty clear. Gentile peoples, praise the one true God of Israel. Verse 2. For, here's the reason, for his loving kindness or his mercy, his grace, is great toward, notice the pronoun, us. Us, Israel. And the truth of Yahweh is everlasting. Praise Yah. Praise Yahweh. Now, what is this psalm all about? Um, grace, uh, it's translated mercy in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and truth. Again, paired together, undeserved favor, and the covenant faithfulness of God to Israel. 
Look, God's covenant faithfulness, his mercy is great. Uh, his mercy and grace are great toward us. And the truth of Yahweh is everlasting. That means he never, 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 never goes back on what he promised. Therefore, pagan, Gentile, outside nations, praise Yahweh. And we see again Gentile participation in God's keeping his promise to bless Israel. There's one more text that follows this same pattern, Romans 15, 12. And there Paul quotes Isaiah, There shall come the root of Jesse, and he who arises to rule over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles hope. This is Isaiah chapter 11. Turn there. This is the promise of Messiah from the line of David. Ironic placement in the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah 10, the nation of Assyria, which arrayed itself against God and his people, was cut down by God and none of the trees in their forest stood. And the next verse, change of scene, then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, Isaiah 11.1. 1. In other words, you're looking at Israel and Israel looks like a flattened forest. But out of the stump of Jesse, the, the, the root ball, a shoot will spring and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. Look down at verse 10. This shoot from the roots is then called the root of Jesse. Then in that day, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse. Uh, let me just ask you this. In, in what sense can someone be a branch or a shoot or a descendant of somebody and the root of that same somebody? Only if it's the God-man. <laughs> Only if the creator of the universe becomes a baby as a descendant of Jesse through David. This is a really remarkable testimony of the deity of Messiah. You need to read all of uh, Isaiah 11. Um, really remarkable promises. I'll just summarize them for you here. Israel's promised Messiah will rule the nations. There will be world peace. There will even be peace in the animal kingdom. Predation will come to an end. The wolf will lie down with the lamb. This is an unprecedented time in human history. Since Cain slaughtered his brother Abel, there has not been such world peace as is promised in Isaiah 11. And it is not yet the eternal state. There is a day coming when the branch and the root, that is the Messiah, will rule over the nations. And that is exactly what is quoted in Romans 15. In that day, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse. He will stand as a signal. Uh, other translations say that signal has the idea of rulership. Uh, he will be the flag and the ensign to which all the nations run. They will seek him out. They will look for him. And his resting place will be glorious. Back to Romans 15. What is Paul doing with all these texts? There is a really unique progression of Gentile participation here. Sam Pagel pointed out this progression a couple years ago in a sermon on this text. Gentiles go from being conquered and seeing firsthand that Israel's God is the one true God. Then the nations are commanded to rejoice with God's people. The destruction of God's enemies and a fulfillment of God's promises will be good for Gentile onlookers who attach themselves. Next, Gentiles will hope in Israel's spiritual welfare and they will praise the God of Israel. And finally, all the nations will be ruled by Israel's Messiah and the nations will put their hope in him. These texts all indicate an anticipation of realities that are yet to come. By the way, Israel will not see these promises come to fruition without repentance, which is what Paul has already covered in this letter. What would it be like if Jew and Gentile in the first century all grappled with God's great big design? What would their relationships to one another be like? Oh, you're a recipient of mercy too? 
Let me show you God's mercy in my life as an outsider ingrafted, and then you show me God's mercy to you as one who is inside but rejected it and was preserved by God's kindness. And let's together look forward to what the church is to be a preview of, a coming kingdom when ethnic distinctions and cultural differences will still exist and we will love it. And we'll love each other, and we'll serve each other, and we will be like Christ in it. Can't the church look like that now? That is Paul's argument. And Paul brings that to a close with an empowering supplication, his closing prayer in this section. He says, May the God of hope, he is the source, fill you with all joy and peace, that's the content, in believing, that is the means, so that, that's the purpose, you will abound in hope, in the power of the Holy Spirit. May the God of hope, hope again is that solid confidence in what God promised, and God is the source of it. True hope can only come from him because he's the only true sovereign He's the only one who can control the outcomes of events. You put your hope in anything else or anyone else, they can't control history. They can't bring your hopes to pass. But hope in God is rock solid because God is the orchestrator of history. He's the only one that can guarantee his promises. And notice the request, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. Joy and peace are at the opposite end from rancor and jealousy and bitterness that result from the selfish use of Christian liberties in the body of Christ. If you're full of all joy, you have no need of living for yourself at the expense of your brother. And if you're full of all peace, you have no temptation towards judging your brother for his use of his liberties. And may he fill you with all joy and peace in believing. That is, how you get filled with all joy and peace, it comes from God by believing. By believing what? All that God has said, all that he has promised. This assumes that you know something. You can't believe something you don't know. You can't know something that you have not exposed your mind to. This is the read your Bible portion of the sermon. You got to know what God said. You got to know God's promises, believe God's promises, and they will fill you with God's joy and peace. So that, what is the purpose? So that you will abound in hope, Paul says. Overflowing with hope, to have plenty of hope, to have confidence in what God has promised. And all of this hope is forward looking. This is an anticipation of something yet to come, not something we already have presently. And this section concludes with the anticipation of that coming reality. And Paul says we have this in the power of the Holy Spirit. He recognizes that supernatural power is required for such a lofty request. And this is exactly what he asks for. To the degree that Jew and Gentile and weak and strong can love one another and experience real unity in the diversity in the body of Christ... They experience and demonstrate the realities of the coming kingdom of Christ, the kingdom which will have no end, the kingdom which will culminate in the eternal state. And in Christ's coming kingdom and in the eternal state, there will be natural and cultural distinctions, uniquenesses, diversity, but no sin. It will be beautiful. And the church now is supposed to be a preview of that coming reality as a testimony to the power of the gospel the truth of God's word, and the supernatural transformation of sinners by the Holy Spirit. We were born enemies of God, and we naturally live as enemies to one another. But God has done a work through his Messiah to make enemies sit at his table as friends. Let's pray. In the words of your servant, the prophet Isaiah, O God of hosts, we look forward to that day that you will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on that mountain, a banquet of aged wine and choice pieces with marrow and refined aged wine. On that mountain, you will swallow up the covering which is over all peoples, that curse, even the veil which is stretched over all the nations. You will swallow up death for all time and You, Yahweh, will wipe tears away from all faces. You will remove the reproach of your people Israel from all the earth, for you have spoken. And it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God for whom we have waited.
that you might save us. This is Yahweh for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in your salvation.